Maybe. <laughs>
We are, for folks in the audience, we are on <clears throat> and recording, and microphones will pick up the sound. So, you ready, Mr. Yes, let's call us meeting one, and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. John Brotherton here. Moto Johnson here. Katie Johnston here. Diana Mendoza here. Judy Pettit. Joe Robinson here. Tyler Wilson. Sounds good. I guess I'll make the motion to approve the agenda. We will be in correct as items as presented. I'll make the motion. Who will second? I second the motion. Joe will second it. John Brotherton? Aye. Moto Johnson? Aye. Aye. Katie Johnston? Aye. Diana Mendoza? Aye. Joe Robinson? Aye. <laughs> we have two people to watch this evening. Okay. Short window. I'll defer. Oh, yes. You want him to go first? Okay. Yeah. Daniel, Don't put all the pressure on me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> hey, not all of you. You're a big boy. You can handle it. <laughs> I also have a sentimentation in mind, but just my own. A few months ago, I was here for the meeting, um, and I want to address an issue. I know that we have a lot of Hispanic kids in the school system. Is there a way that we can arrange with Parkland or with the high school to have a kid come in that is bilingual to kind of be a student teacher's aid to help out some of these kids? I mean, some of these kids' parents are from Mexico and don't even speak English. How are they supposed to help them with their homework? And there's a way you guys can set them like that up where a tenant partner would get credit or a high school kid would get some kind of credit. Wouldn't that help out a little bit? I don't know, John, you're looking right at me. I'm looking right at you, but, uh, well, Superintendent? Well, would you like uh, me to follow up or one of the board members to follow well, up? Well, I don't care. I mean, I just want somebody, like, I have a degree, a college degree, like I said, just barely. I don't understand core math at all. So if I don't understand it, what is somebody that doesn't understand English? They're really lost. Which means they won't be able to help their kids with their homework or anything. You know, I want to see ranked school kids go to college, transport, the military, whatever. And then whether they come back here or whether they go elsewhere, I want them to be a success. And I want them to know that their success may of what this town did for them or what the school did for them. I don't want to have a town full of People that aren't going anywhere. And they're stuck here. Maybe folks they have no choice. Thank you. Well, I got two minutes left. Yeah, Can I defer that time in the window and make him talk seven? Heaven help us. Um, no, but uh, I. 
You know, I don't know if my idea is tangible, but it is an idea. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to name a few people. Does anybody in here know who a Chalice Pitts is? You can't answer when you can't answer, Mono. Who? Who is? A Chalice Pitts. You may not know her. She placed in the long jump of the football jump a few years ago in fact. You know where she's going to school? The same school that Thurman Marshall joined the way in for. That's a pretty big success story, I think. How about his uh, grandson, U of I? Not many kids get into U of I. I know I shouldn't know. I wasn't smart enough. And I didn't try real hard in high school either. Uh, but you know what I'm saying. We need to highlight the things like that, and we need more things like that to come out of here. Well, I feel like Rachel has a pretty good success rate of educated yeah. students. You know what? Uh, In my class, right. I had people that went to Ivy League schools. Okay. Um, several of us went to the U of I. How long ago was that? Oh, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then let's not do that. Yeah. Um, but you were. Okay. Um, my nephew graduated, went through the whole Rancho City school system okay. and is now at Michigan at UMich. And he's an out of stater and it, that's even hard to get into that school. Right. So. My time, no. <laughs> uh, pardon me? Uh, oh. Well, on Facebook and the marketplace mm -hmm. and the housing, mm -hmm. The elementary school system in Rand Hall is a 3 out of 10. The high school is a 2 out of 10. <clears throat> that ain't none. If young people in the room here have kids, that's just a thing. My time. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you like me to stand up in the window. You may have half of it. I don't think what I said was man, but you can understand him better, probably. I understood everything you said. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay. I concur with what Mr. Dan said. I also would like to say again to the board, if we are going to have bilingual here, it needs to flow into the English-only students as well at this level. They're going to have a hard time later on competing if they don't. And let's go way back. When I was in school, it was French. Everybody had to learn the second language, and it was French. Well, it's not that way anymore. It's Spanish. So if the students, since the students are coming through here, Spanish need to be taught as well to these students so that they can communicate as well with other students, especially students who don't have the ethnic background that they do. It's important that they have a relationship one to another knowing what's going on. I've asked before, I'm asking again. I've talked before, I'm asking again. Let's get the second language to the non-Spanish speaking students. Not saying who's from where, but we were here already. And people who speak a second language are coming in. You need to be able to communicate with them as well. If they're gonna, we're gonna pay for programs for them to have English. We need to pay for programs for our children to have Spanish. It's only fair. Board is only fair. Implement a program to where these students 
can learn Spanish. Who knows? Having a second language could enhance them. I'm looking at the clock too. Could enhance them to want to learn something else better. Math, social studies, read, learning to read better. But we got to do something in order to meld these children. So when they do go out into the workplace or even to the playground, they're speaking each other's language. So everybody is bilingual. Will everyone adapt to it? No, everyone will not. But it should be made available to them. There should be accessibility for these students to have. Part two, nowhere in corporate America does anyone make anything without ACE evaluation. No one. No matter what job you have, you have to have an evaluation and it cannot be elementary. It has to be an evaluation that fits the position that that individual holds. Since Dr. Woods was supposed to have an evaluation in February, an evaluation should have been done. You just don't give out money without an evaluation. That's money that is taxpayer dollars. Don't do that to us. There should be an evaluation. There should be an evaluation. Didn't do it this year, but it still needs to be done. The money is already gone. But that should be, we need to know. We need to, as citizens, we need to know how you are spending the money. And that right there is not good. You can't give out an elementary evaluation on the salary that Mr. Wood is making. Because otherwise, you shouldn't even do an evaluation. Just say I'm giving them the money. And that's with anyone that's in the system, any job, there's an evaluation. Probation, evaluation. Those are determining factors on whether or not you're staying. Okay, that's my say. And I'm going to live with it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Okay. Since Nikki joined us, I do need to take another attendance. So that Sorry, I, I had to check on my side. Yeah, that's okay. I just need to take another attendance to record when she got here. And so, um, okay. John Brotherton here. Moto Johnson here. Katie Johnston here. Diana Mendoza here. Nikki Pettit here. Joe Robinson here. Tyler Wilson. Thank you. Okay. We go to number four. Mm -hmm. Set agenda. I'll make the motion if that's okay again. Motion approved the consent agenda items including personnel report as submitted with the stipulation that each individual is required to comply with all requirements for new hires as indicated in Illinois state statutes and RCS board policy and procedures, including ratification of bills prepaid by the finance manager under board policy 4.50. This motion was made by me. Who would like to second? I'll second it. Okay, Katie will second it. John Brotherton? Aye. Mildred Johnson? Aye. Katie Johnston? Aye. Diana Mendoza? Aye. Nikki Pettit? Aye. Joe Robinson? Aye. All right. Allison Didier and Kelly Crawford are coming up to present. And I'll let you two introduce yourselves. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I just said your names, but the board needs to know what you do. Okay. Don't start our timer yet. We are on strict <laughs> orders here, so sticking on our time. So um, thank you for letting us speak with you this evening. I've met most of you. I'm Allison Didier, I'm the Director of Special Ed. I'm Kelly Crawford, the Assistant Director of Special Ed. And we want to share an update with you about the wonderful things that we've been doing in our department. We have not had an opportunity to present to you um, as a group yet. So our biggest um, push this last year and last couple of years has been uh, co-teaching. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And he's going to prompt me by pushing my slides. Or you tell me when I quit. You tell me when I quit. Oh, you're fine. 
Um, so first, let's talk just a little bit about our student population. So uh, when we're talking about co-teaching, we're talking about students with disabilities. We're talking about students who have been identified as requiring specialized instruction. And so when you look at this graphic here on the right, um, and I hope you guys have it in front of you because I know it's kind of small. This represents our students in Rantoul who have been identified as meeting the criteria for special education. So you can see here every year they take um, an enrollment. Last year we were down probably due to COVID and low enrollment. We had 327 students. Uh, that fluctuates a lot. So that's a one day um, in December. They take that number and tell um, and use that for a full year. We've had as many as 370 in the past few years. So we're, we're down quite a bit. When you look at our population here on the right, um, this represents just the students with IEPs. So this is not a percent of our total population. This is when you're just looking at our students with identified disabilities. And this talks about um, which eligibility criteria they fall under. Go to the next is this, this, go ahead. Students have multiple disabilities. Is this just the primary disability? Correct, okay. yep. So the next graphic is really small, oh, yeah, but if you just look at the colors, um, the light green is um, us and the dark green is the state. And this is just a different representation of that um, wheel graphic that you just saw. You can see that we're pretty close to the state in each of the categories with the exception of speech language. We are um, quite a bit higher um, than the state average. We're sitting at about 27% of our students have identified um, as having a speech language impairment compared to about 16%. So all that uh, is important when we talk about the services that we provide. Almost a third of our student population does not require specialized instruction from a special ed teacher. If they require speech language services, that is provided by a speech language pathologist. So Tara and her department um, work with that group. So that is a, a big group of, of our students. When we talk about co-teaching, we're talking about the students um, who are eligible under other categories. So these are not our students with speech language impairments. Excuse me. Yes. Under the um, emotional disability. Yes, sir. We're much higher than the state. Yes. Is there a reason? Um, that, well, you can see that it's gone down just in this last year. Um, there is certainly a, um, a correlation um, with over identification of emotional disabilities in higher poverty areas. That's, that is a, a trend um, in, in districts in Illinois, but that's certainly something that we're continuing to focus on. In the spring, we share with you our annual report that we get from the state, and that's something that the state monitors as well. Okay, and, and also with the speech, speech or language mm -hmm. impairment, is that because of the- There are similar of correlations um, that in higher poverty areas, there's, there's higher percentages of students with speech language impairments. Okay. But also something that, uh, that we continue to focus on address yeah okay go ahead um this just kind of summarized what i i just was explaining uh, when we look at our student population about 40 percent of those students with ieps qualify as either having a specific learning disability or other health impairment other health impairment for the most part not always um is due to adhd and so when we think about that big of a group of students, most of those students have IEP goals and require services that are academic focused. They are working on reading, math, executive functioning, with my, which might be um, organization, sustaining attention in the classroom, um, focusing while the teacher is instructing some of there's a little bit of emotional regulation um, that can be addressed as well but that population is a group that really we should be focusing on providing their services in the general ed environment so what was happening prior to us implementing co-teaching is we were only providing special ed services in more of a pullout model meaning if i'm the special ed teacher i come and get nikki from her classroom i take her to another place i work with her maybe one-on-one -on -one or three-on-one -on -one, and then i return her to her gen ed classroom so it's very fragmented we're going to talk a little bit about that i know this is going to push you over time if i ask questions sorry um, I'm already over of our total student population what yes. percentage of our students have IEPs? Right? um i believe it's roughly about 22 as of last year's numbers which is higher than the state average as well um so why do we want to want to do co-teaching i want to start by just introducing 
um, the fact that co-teaching is not a new concept. This really came to light and really started being pushed um, even back in the early 90s. As with anything else, that there were ebbs and flows. Um, we're going to talk kind of about the history that RCS has had, but co-teaching is a model for providing specialized instruction or special ed that allows students to remain with their gen ed teacher in their classroom with their peers. So it is an inclusive model for providing those services. Um, let's see if there's anything else I didn't touch on here. It, you know, there's a lot of research about co-teaching. I could spend all day talking about it. Both Kelly and I are very uh, passionate about it. Um, the very bottom line is that it results in improved outcomes for students with disabilities. Kind of the same thing. Keep going. What is <laughs> Um, Co-teaching, it's more than just one professional there to support students. So you have your special education teacher and your general education teacher. It's a cooperative learning <coughs> environment and it's collaboration for all of the students in the room. So it just doesn't focus on the students with IEPs. All of the students in the room benefit from having both teachers in the class. Um, it's an opportunity for endless possibilities. So there are at least six models of co-teaching and uh, you can group the students in multiple ways. Um, it, you can just go on and on and on about all the different things you can do with co-teaching. Um, it's dependent on co-planning and co-scheduling. So if we didn't allow co-planning for our teachers, that really just forces them to act independently and that totally undermines co-teaching. So we make sure we provide that for them. It's co-scheduling. So Allison and I work with building principals to create their master schedules um, to make sure our resource teachers are implementing co-teaching properly. And then the teachers plan together, they instruct the class together, they collaborate for assessment, grading, and instruction. So that special educator coming into the classroom has to wear all of those hats like the general education teacher does as well. Um, you can go on. So it's an ideal setting um, for the teachers to have common planning time to facilitate their work together for inclusion. It allows them to meet the needs of struggling and advanced learners in the classroom. Um, learning from two people is better <laughs> than just one, you know, two brains are better than one. And it's a way to connect and support with others and you're helping all of the kids succeed in the class, succeed in the classroom. And it just makes the school run more um, efficiently and more effectively and meeting all those individualized needs. Um, do we, do we have adequate staff for that? Yes, that's a great We're question. We're going to get to that, but yes. yes. Okay, yes. Because, so we will talk I mean, about, I know that we're always talking about we don't have enough of Yes. In a couple more slides, Allison will go through the timeline of what it looks like to get co-teaching going and what how it was used in the past and how we've come this far. So. Okay, because you know I know. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, co-teaching is not a remedial class, so, so it's not looked upon as this is the class where all the struggling learners are. That's not what it is. Um, it's more than differentiating, though, because, you know, differentiating should be involved in every gen ed class, and it's way more than that. Um, what else? It's not designated for one of the partners to work as a tutor with all the struggling students. It really is a cohesive um, learning environment where both educators are contributing to the classroom. So. All right. And now we'll get to some of the history of co-teaching. I, I, the last thing on here, I feel like. Oh, should I say, say this? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so it is co-teaching is not placing special education students in general education classrooms with unrealistic expectations or without adaptations to the instruction or material. So we're not just throwing these kids in the general education without giving them support. And there's, um, like Elsa, we can go on forever, but there's even very... Um, we provide our teachers with a lot of resources to learn how to develop specialized design instruction for our students as well. Okay, so I had to do a little bit of digging because I wanted to go way back to when we first um, implemented uh, co-teaching here. So luckily we have Vicki Cox who works as our instructional coach at the junior high who is um, my go-to when I need to know about what has happened in, in special ed in this district. And she was able to pull up some emails from 2006 to make sure she had the date right. So um, they introduced uh, co-teaching under a previous administration. They tried to implement it both at or and at the elementary school. 
Um, I couldn't tell you how many years it, it did happen, but um, Rachel Palmer was also able to confirm that she was one of the co-teachers at that time um, for probably a variety of reasons. It, it, you know, like I said, ebbed and flowed. They maybe weren't implementing it with fidelity. Um, when Barb Moore, who was my predecessor, came here and when we pulled out um, of the co-op, she reintroduced, she used the word reinstated in her presentation to the board. They reinstated co-teaching at the junior high. So I'm sure there was kind of a renewed focus and um, professional development and some of those things that happened in 2015. Um, that was only at the element or at the middle school level, excuse me, and that has continued. We have have continued providing co-taught at the middle school since that time. Um, in 2017, there were plans. There was kind of a long term plan to implement co-teaching starting at fourth and fifth grade. However, and this is what Moto was alluding to, they were unable to fill um, the, the special ed part of the co-teaching um, role at our elementary school. So when I came here in 2017 to Broadmeadow, we did only have one resource teacher at every building. So that teacher had to meet the needs of kindergarten all the way through fifth grade. And there's just no feasible way to do that and co-teach at sixth grade levels. It's just not possible. So our goal was to kind of move towards that. Obviously, staffing continued to be an issue. Um, we were not able to implement it in 2018 or 2019 either. And um, so we look at 1920. Uh, it continued to be kind of our goal to get there. We had a renewed focus. We were planning on hiring two resource teachers at every elementary school. Um, we met with principals, helped them develop a master schedule that would allow for it. The plan was for each special ed teacher to co-teach at three grade levels. So if I'm the special ed teacher, I go into kindergarten for a certain amount of time. I go into first grade, I go into second grade and support the needs of those kids. Unfortunately, we all know what happened in uh, 2020. And so we kind of had to uh, put a pause on our, our plans because of COVID. So 2021, we had shortened day. Um, and if you'll remember, this is what was really interesting that came out of that. We were providing in-person learning four days a week. Most students got to come two days a week. We invited students with IEPs to attend all four days a week. This did not include students who were speech only. So in all of those other categories, if you had an IEP, you were eligible to come to school all four days. So what was interesting about that is our students with IEPs, when we look at our district data, and we've talked about our ECRIS data, um, and I'm not gonna, your eyes will glaze over if I get into that too much, um, but that data is able to give us kind of a historical look on how some of our groups have performed over time. When we look at that data, our students with IEPs made more progress during that year, and it's relative, it's not absolute, more of those students met their growth goals than that group had met in the history of the data that we had been collecting. Also, compared to their non-disabled peers, we were meeting their own individual growth goals at higher rates. So what does that mean? That means that for me, this was evidence that our kids with IEPs having more access to their teacher and more access to the general ed instruction than their peers was, was beneficial. I mean, that was the data that, that essentially proved it. Now, it's just a correlation, right? Um, but that was pretty important for us and again just really helped us to move forward with we really want to we want to implement this co teaching. Um, so we, we continued with that. I'll let you. Yeah, I'll do this. The, the co teaching vision. This was created summer 2021 at one of our professional developments with administrators, <coughs> special educators, general educators and instructional coaches. RCS 137 will implement a co-teaching service based on co-instruction, co-planning, co and co-assessment to create a safe learning environment that increases student growth. Our th RCS is dedicated to addressing and meeting the needs of all students while embracing and celebrating differences. The special education teacher and the general education teacher will share a collaborative partnership to support all students with strategies to master the content. Co-teaching will provide the most effective educational and social outcomes for all students. All students will feel like a valued member of the school community while striving to meet high academic and social expectations. So, and then last summer we um, hosted a co-teaching boot camp, is what we called, 
over 32 teachers, um, four admin and many instructional coaches attended that. So we provided a four day, four half days of training of how to co-plan, how to co-assess, how to co-grade, co-classroom management. I mean, you name it, we, we, we taught them how to do it. Um, we created that vision together. Um, the master schedules were created that allowed for co-teaching and co-training. We had training and coaching observations with Susan Hentz, who is a nationally rec recognized consultant in the field of co-teaching. Um, she visited many classrooms and met with co-teaching partners and then gave them direct feedback about rec recommendations to make while they're teaching. We hosted monthly co-teaching workshops. Um, Susan co and I co-facilitated some of those. We used her on teacher institute days. Um, we also did tons of walkthroughs for the classroom teachers from their admin. Um, we, when RCS wrote out cold teaching, we did everything that the research and evidence tells you to do with it. We provided ongoing training and resources for our teachers. We worked with a consultant and all the schedules were created with um, a collaborative team of administrators. We also provided so many resources for the coaches and teachers, <laughs> such as manuals for co-teaching, manuals for training specialty design instructions, and tons of reference guides. when we learned about those at the monthly PD. So, so if you brag about RCS for anything, I would say co-teaching needs to be <laughs> close to the top. So, and coming up this year, we are going to um, make sure the schedules again have time to co-plan. We're going to make sure that all the partners in the district have time um, to plan and prepare for their lessons. We're going to continue with professional development for administrators, special educators, general educators. Um, we'll make sure we continue with the walkthroughs. We're giving our teachers feedback. Susan Hentz is going to join us again, and we're going to do monthly workshops again. So. I think what I would just like to add that we we didn't put in our slide here is that it really has been amazing how um, the teachers have really taken off with this and been willing. We've got some partners who will contact us and say, hey, would you come watch a lesson? I'd like your feedback on X. I want you to come see this. Um, and with everything that our teachers are doing right now and uh, learning new curriculum and dealing with student behavior and evaluation, uh, they have been so accepting of this and really just um, taken off with it. So I'm, I'm really pleased with how far we've come. Kelly has really been doing a lot of the legwork with it. Um, I think we've made a, a lot of growth in the last uh, two-ish years that we've been able to kind of get this going. And um, it's certainly something that we're very proud of. So proud of our staff for sure. So. Questions? How many minutes was it? <laughs> make a comment. <laughs> Um, right you. now, he's not going to make it. I get it. Later. Exactly. Safe Friday. Um, the one thing I just, just so the board is aware in the community, so one of the, some big things were done through this most recent contract with our uh, teachers that supports this, and that is uh, extending the school day for mm -hmm. our staff, and that is about us giving them more time to plan together. Mm -hmm. And also, there is a piece in the contract now which our teachers who are special ed certified get, we call it a hard to fill bonus. So they get, they do get paid more uh, than a general classroom teacher uh, at this point. So that's something we've been working in and now it's regularly in the contract. So um, I think that has definitely helped us uh, be competitive uh, in hiring for our special ed positions. Cause we're really, I don't, I don't want to say it now because we still got four weeks till school starts, right. but we're staffed out pretty darn well right now for special ed. At the elementary level, for sure, um, we're, we look really good filling our positions. So. Yeah. You have one vacancy in the junior high. Yes. So don't act like you know, Yes. <laughs> um, our consultant works in the nation with, mm -hmm. I mean, all over 50 states and um, she'll call me every now and then and say, hey, are your ears ringing? I just bragged about RCS to these districts I'm working with. And she uses the way um, we implemented co-teaching with doing the walkthroughs, meeting with the teachers, meeting with the principals. She brags about that to other districts of the nation. So, yeah. I have a, I have a comment, but Lindell has it back in the back. Mrs. Diddy, uh, the number that was on the, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. President, the number that was on the board initially in the first yes. part of the presentation, uh -huh. of that number, mm -hmm. what percentage mm -hmm. of those students 
or daily medicated? Um, I, well, we don't have that information. Um, I mean, I could guesstimate, but it, yeah, I, we aren't privy to that information. And that would be a violation of their medical right. Right, right, yeah. I mean, in some cases, we might know if, if we're giving the medication at school, for example. So the medication is not being given at school anymore? Not always. Not, not for all students. Mm -mm. It can be if they want it to be. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's the question. Board, any comments? Good job. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'd like to say, I mean, you know, this is what uh, the public needs to know. <clears throat> you know, uh, a lot of times we have negative things coming through here. And we're going to continue to get negative things because there's negative things going on here. Mm -hmm. But um, our last board meeting with the uh, presentation with Pleasant Acres and then this presentation here makes me glad that I'm sitting in this chair mm -hmm. to be able to say that at least some of us are making an effort to make it better here. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my goal. That's why I'm sitting here. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's why the people that voted me in voted me in because I care. Um, Dr. Woods already answered uh, some of the questions. One, I was going to ask, you're talking about all the things that you did and all the, the, the um, you know, programs and stuff that these teachers went through, the 32 uh, teachers mm -hmm. and the four administrators, administrators. I was wondering, was that your time? And you did that on your time, but he kind of said that you guys were, some of you were at least getting, getting, getting a, some type of bonus. Yeah, well, we work also. Yeah, we're 12 months, so. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. I mean, there's, sometimes you get you get people that donate their time to become better. Oh, sure. And, yeah. and you know, I, I like to take my, take my hat off to, people, mm -hmm. to teachers that want to learn and be better to make our yeah. school system better because, mark my word, we need to be better. Well, we've had the, the monthly PDs that, that we talked about. Those were always after school. Mm -hmm. um, they're optional. We, you know, we, we can't require that teachers attend. And we had a great turnout for that. We had a lot of teachers who came to every single one okay. because they, they wanted to learn and they, they were really invested. So we definitely have staff who are motivated. So. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, you're fine. This is not my time, I'd like to say. <laughs> I've already talked to him about it. I'm in charge. <laughs> yeah. Like at home. <laughs> Ladies, I don't know if this is an appropriate question or not that you can answer. But how is it going, in your mind, how will it be different this year than it was last year? Sure. You know, I think last year with, with it being our first year of implementing, a lot of that was about kind of the structure of co-teaching and the logistics. You know, we certainly did have a focus on the quality of, of what the instruction looked like, but a lot of what we were doing was kind of working out the kinks of scheduling and um, goal writing and lesson planning and things like that. I think our focus this year will shift more into kind of the quality of what's happening in those rooms and really digging into that specialized instruction and what are the services that we're providing. Now that we have it in place and we're able to provide it, what are what does that look like in the classroom? And also the special educators. Um, last year when they were learning three grade level curriculums, this year they'll like be even better about it. They be, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> they will, um, now they know the curriculum, now they'll get to learn it better. Whereas our general educators are content experts. That's what they learn in college, how to teach it. Special educators only learn how to specialize the curriculum. So now they have full exposure to all the general education curriculum and they'll know it even better going into this year. Thank you. And I know you'll keep posting and updating on these things. Thank you again. Thank you for your Thank you. Thank you. All right. Seven is phone stipend change. I, I'll talk as much as you let me. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is an overdue, I would say, increase. Um, the uh, We do have 32 employees who receive a phone allowance, which is part of 
uh, they have to use their personal mobile phone as a, as a regular and ongoing part of their job. Um, so 20 of these folks are classified as administrators and 12 are support staff. So support staff, for instance, would be our nurses, um, some of our clericals in certain roles, uh, the warehouse manager. Um, and so we've there's a variety of folks that uh, do receive this because they are expected to use their personal phone on a regular basis. So this has not been increased in a long time. Um, so that's why I'm bringing the proposal to you for increasing it uh, in the amounts indicated here. Any comments? I, I do, I would have to agree that it's been a long, long time. And I, I was not aware until it was presented before me that, you know, who needs to have these phones? And, that, you know, um, it, it's only fair that, that these people are being reimbursed at a higher level. So I, I'm certainly on board with this. Right, and the alternative to this is we buy all of these people phones yes. and put them on a phone plan. So it is cheaper for the district to do yes. this. Way. So, all right. I make the motion to approve the item as recommended. Thank you, Joe. I'll second. Any discussion? Uh, I just have one question. What's the difference between the administrators and increase considered non administrators? I mean, a phone to phone, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's about the uh, volume of use on it. It's, it's an estimate for sure. Okay. I, mean, I was just, yeah. it just kind of shocked me because I just figured if you're using your phone, you're using your phone. Yeah. And I, um, the administrators are kind of on call all the time, I, I would say is, uh, uh, and, and that's a big difference where the other folks are hourly employees and for the most part, put it away. Um, they'll answer it. But, I mean, I, I know I go home, Allison goes home and we're still making phone calls from home and, um, doing it on our cell phones for that for work so if you want to give those 12 people 90 dollars a month i'm sure they'd be thrilled <laughs> so, I need one. No. <laughs> you just got business cards well, not I, phones I, I, any other phone. <laughs> baby steps right More? <laughs> okay no. say hello sean brother hi moto johnson hi Katie Johnston. Aye. Diana Mendoza. Aye. Nikki Pettit. Aye. Joe Robinson. Aye. Okay, leave this number eight. Our last action item of the night. Student and family handbook description. All right, so we did approve the student family handbook last month, but uh, the Illinois Principals Association, after our June board meeting, released the revised model student handbook. So there were some things that needed to be updated. Um, it was just bad timing. Uh, so there's an updated section on awareness and prevention of child sex, sexual abuse, grooming behavior, and boundary violations. There's actually a, uh, a corresponding board policy that was updated related to that. There's a new law about grooming, uh, grooming in terms of um, child sex abuse. Um, updated policy on the prevention of anaphylaxis and uh, access to non-school sponsored publications. So those were all policies that we've updated, um, but they need to be in the student handbook also. And then the other piece is we did not decide last week. We tabled the dress code. Um, so I am coming to you with, uh, there is a document here which has the full dress code and the three options. And you can see, you know, we're talking about this highlighted in yellow one line. That, that's where... Um, the board needs to make a decision tonight. Um, so I came with three options as suggestions. The board can uh, change it, amend the language, however you want, but this is just to get us started. Um, so option one would be no head coverings. I would essentially be leaving the dress code the way it is right now, okay? Um, option two would just be allowing everything. Um, and so that would include hats, uh, hair bonnets, head scarves, head wraps. Um, and I've got to update that language no matter what, because that except as a religious observance should not be in there on that one. Um, 
And then option three, which was part of what I think we were discussing last month, is um, allowing students to wear headscarves, head wraps, and do rags, but not allowing um, hoods, hats, hair bonnets, um, those types of things. So um, that I'll just put it out there. So what we would do as a board is when you're if you think you've come to consensus on which option, make the motion to approve the dress code with the option. So if you pick option one with option one, and then we would you would vote on that. If it if nothing passes, we stay with what we currently have. Okay, until the next meeting, and then we try to board again, unless the board president tells me to stop bringing it to the board. Okay, um, so. Discussion. I'll turn it over. I'm done now. Are you sure? Well, you if you ask me questions, I will answer. So. Okay. Awesome. So I'll ballpark now. Guys, what do you want to do? Think what option sounds good or what? Okay. I'm in favor of everything. <laughs> simply because I've talked to lots of people, and even last night I was speaking to someone, and he was saying how. For him, it was a to be able to wear a hat was a comfort thing. He's 45 years old now, and he said he remembers being told not to, to wear a hat when he was younger in school, and how it really it obviously it stayed with him because he's 45. Um, he's like it was just a comfort thing because my hair. And this is a, a white gentleman. I feel the need that's important to say that, um, and he's like. I just, it made me feel more comfortable to have a hat on it. It wasn't that I wasn't paying attention to the teacher or anything like that. It just, it was a comfort thing for me. And he said, I even wore a hat at my wedding. So I, just to be able to wear a hat and feel comfortable, it put more ease and I was able to pay more attention when I was able to wear a hat. And I think that that is, I've heard from several other parents and students that a lot of our, um, I don't know the correct terminology, it's probably not special needs, it's probably not the correct terminology, but um, some of our people that have emotional needs, they just have more of a comfort if they are allowed to cover up. And then as I had talked about last month, it is an advantage for our um, children of color to be able, if their hair is not done, to be able to wear some type of a head cover or scarf or something like that. So I'm in favor of option two. I'm in favor of option two as well. Um, you know, after discussion, I had kind of the same consensus where, you know, um, it's just such kind of a seemingly minimal thing that can make a really big difference. Um, another thing is, you know, it doesn't take away the teacher's right to enforce, you know, their classrooms kind of as they need to if it becomes disruptive or anything like that. So I mean, as long as we're making it so like, you know, our teachers can still manage their classrooms as they need to. I'm in favor of us, you know, providing those options for our students. And another thing I want to say is I kind of liken it to us as adults being able to, it's casual Friday, how it's there's, I believe there are studies that prove that we're more productive when we are comfortable and are able to dress casually. And I think our students are saying that that's what they need. And if we say that our students' education is our one of our number one things that we need to listen to, I think that we need to listen to the students because I think that they're speaking out and telling us that. I mean, that's kind of the real world, isn't it? Like, once you get to college, you can wear whatever you want to wear on your head. So. So I don't, I don't understand why we're being so strict. I understand that that's how it was, and but I think that that type of thinking is antiquated. Dr. Woods, did did you not? Were you not able to talk with the school staff, meaning the teachers that actually have the children that are in their classes that rejected any type of wearing? You know, they wanted to kind of stick with number one mm -hmm. because of. Um, they felt that it was disruptive and or hampering 
their classroom. Um, and the reason I'm bringing that up is I, I know us as a board is, is going to definitely have our own opinion and I strongly believe what Nikki said with not only um, children of color, but all children that feels more comfortable <coughs> with a hat on or with the scarf on or with whatever on. And we said this in, 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 in the meeting last week that it also creates a problem to where kids automatically now, when they can't do this, just refuse to come to school. Our goal is to keep these kids coming to school and to keep educating them. So we don't want to, at least I don't want to make any teacher or, or staff member feel we're making a decision saying this is what we're going to do and that's the way it's going to be without feeling their, you know, their input of why they feel. I mean, there's not a staff member here that, I mean, I don't know if they knew this was going to be on the board here. here. Well, I mean, that's going to, that's going to speak out that I know of why they honestly feel that it's disruptive. I don't understand that either. So the feedback, uh, I, I did not do a survey because I know uh, how I honestly feel I had a, a pretty good idea of what that would be uh, as the responses. Uh, but quite a few staff members forwarded me their thoughts on this. Um, I don't think it is as much disruption, although that is a piece, and I'll come back to it. I think the main concern uh, that I was hearing from teachers was about safety um, and the ability of students to conceal their, um, their faces. Um, that's what I was told. Um, as far as the disruption, some teachers just don't really like hoodies at all, but I, it's, it had to do with partly with the hood, but also the giant kangaroo pocket in the front. Um, and that's not what we're talking about, right? So the kids smuggle things. In. They bring in candy and stuff in that pocket. Um, so that was more on the disruption side. I, uh, it, the, the number one thing that came to me from teachers was an idea of, of safety. With what was shared with you. What, what I'm saying. It's the concealing of their identity. That you could put your hood up and people wouldn't know who you were. And that's a safety issue. I, that's what I, I'm just sharing. I'm just, I'm just sharing the feedback. Where's the safety I issue on that? I mean, don't get me wrong. I have a son that wears a hoodie. Um, I'm sure he does not wear that hoodie all the time. But like you said, you know, um, when he's getting bullied or talked about because he dyed his hair blue, he throws his hoodie up so he don't have to listen to it. Mm -hmm. So that gives him, like you said, more reason to be more concentrating on what's going on in class instead of listening to the kid next to him, sit there and calling him all kinds of names about having blue hair. So I, I just wanted to get more of an understanding of why teachers who when you have a student in your class and you see that student all the time, hoodie or not, you know if that kid is paying attention to you. At least I would if I was teaching that class. You know, that's just my opinion. I'm not saying that any other teacher, I mean, you know, I don't have 20 or 30, well, actually I have coached over 20 or 30 kids at the same time, and I know if they were paying attention to me or not. I'm just asking, you know, if it's a safety reason, okay, you know what? I can understand that, but I just don't see the unsafe part of it. I think Moto, um, last month, Rachel was saying something about like, if there were an active shooter or something like that, to be able to identify a student. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that opinion or that thought process because mm -hmm. one, your your student's going to be in your, in your room grow with you. Grow yeah, yeah, and you're going to know. And if there is some type of a mass exodus, I believe that even still the teacher would know, okay, well, Johnny had on a red hoodie. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that you know that type of stuff, especially in that type of exactly. situation. Yes, ma'am. And also, um, I don't know about your, excuse me, son, but I know that my daughter wears the same hoodie over and over and over again so that it can darn near walk around <laughs> itself yeah. by itself. And so, you know, oh, that's Amia in the white hoodie again, or that's Kalel in the Lakers hoodie. I mean, you just, you know, 
that your student is wearing that hoodie. Mm-hmm. You know who it is. So to me, it's I, that's why I disagree with the safety issue. Mm-hmm. I understand. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We have a, the audience. We did have a situation last year uh, at Pleasant <coughs> Acres. One of our preschool TAs went outside on his break for a walk and he had his hood up. Believe you me, the call went out and everybody was scrambling trying to see who that was walking around the building with their hood up and their hands in their pocket. And everybody was afraid because they could not see his face. They didn't know he was a teacher, was an, was an employee. So, and, it, and everybody was scared. I mean, they were running, we were running with walkies trying to see who that was outside. So question, do the employees have to abide by the- Yeah, he was outside, it was cold out and he had his hood up. I understand what you're saying. Yes, but I'm yes. saying, no, we do not wear hoodies. Have to abide by the dress code. Yes, we do not wear hoodies. That, what she's asking is, is if we did, um, have a dress code for these kids, are That's are the are the staff members of the schools, TA, and everyone going to obey by not wearing hats, hoodies, or whatever into the school? Because it's like, it's, 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 you're, 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 you're saying it was outside. You're saying that it's an unsafe act for kids to do it, but yet. Is it okay for a TA to do it? Or a janitor to wear a hat or, oh, you know, or, or is this rule going to be for everybody that works in the school system? Right. Well, the dress code for staff is already approved yes. as part of the um, staff handbook. Um, I will say that uh, no, unless they are in a role where a hat might be typical. So for instance, PE teachers outside, custodians outside, wearing hats is fine. We do have um, female staff members who wear head scarves and head wraps. But did you add, did you hear what she just said? Yes. It was a TA. It had nothing to do with children. Right. It had nothing to do with the kids. No, I'm just saying you, you uh, I heard what I heard you say was the dress code for the staff. Yeah, well, well that's what I was yeah, just kind okay. of bringing that up. Because right. Because I wanted what, to know. Exactly. I'm, if, if we're trying to approve a dress code, a student hand, the dress code for the student handbook, and she's bringing up that it was a TA that was walking outside. I was just curious as to if the employees are to abide by the. Well, basically, he said no because we already we already approved right the staff, staff. And was it cold that day? Is that why he had to say that's up? what she said? Yes. Okay. And he was outside. He was walking. Yeah. On his lunch hour. Joe, sure. I just think you know, given you know today's climate, the way you know things are happening. I can understand the safety issue. I see you at this point where you know you want a student to feel comfortable and you want them to be in a comfortable environment. But you know, with, with today's climate, I can see the safety too. I can see you know not being able to see faces. You know, um, it's it's just the way things are now, and you know it, it's a concern and it, it should be addressed. I, I guess I'm confused still about how it's unsafe if you can't see. You're saying it's unsafe in the classroom if you can't see a child's face. This is so more then, for the classroom, right? Excuse me. I'm sorry. No, I did fine. not mean to do that. This is more in the classroom. So these kids are already so, so in we're the classroom. The we're not talking about hats, walking the halls. Hats, or, hoodies, or, or running around in the classroom, in and out of the classroom. I don't is understand how it's not safe. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I'm lost. I mean... I, because if they go outside, don't they? Don't kids have hats? Don't they have gloves? If if, if the weather's, weather's we, a little chilly, we went two years with masks, cold. and I know that it's hard to identify kids exactly. with masks. We did it. And, we did it with masks. We, yeah. we did it with masks, and you can only see somebody's eyes. I'm just saying that I see both sides of it. <clears throat> I understand that you know we want an environment where kids are comfortable at, and you know they they enjoy the environment that they're in. But what I'm saying is I see both sides of, of the safety. Yeah. When, uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say really quick. It does say in there head coverings that do not cover the face or ears. So. Right. So then they wouldn't be. So if they cinch their hoodie and you That's can't right. see their face, then the teacher says, and that's Johnny, you need to yeah. remove. Yeah. Right. Then their their um, privilege is taken away. It's no. To me, it's no different than when a student a teacher has to say. Johnny, quit talking. Johnny, quit passing notes. I mean, you, it's, I know that you had said previously that that was putting too much 
onus on the teachers because the teachers have enough to deal with. But in my opinion, it's the teachers, that's part of their job to m monitor and control their classroom. Diana. Okay. Thank you. I've been working in the school for many years. I mean, you know, having kids wear scars and hats was disruptive and sometimes because some kids would play with it, some kids just like, I'm in the, you know, like he said, you know, I could see both, both sides, mm -hmm. but you know, my opinion working in for so many years in the school and the consensus of many teachers, it could be disruptive. I mean, that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. Anybody else to you? So we had two board members who have stated option two, mm -hmm. and no one else has no one else has said this option. I think I heard Joe as a one. Well, I think <clears throat> as as board members, it's our job to you know to voice what the people in the city want. So if that's what they want here, if that's what the parents want, then I'm all for it. You know. Um, you know, is their kids and, and you know if they feel that it's gonna help you know their kids and their, their environment walk forward. I would say I don't know that we've asked families necessarily what they want. Formally. Yeah. Some of yeah, us that's have. what I meant. Yeah. Can I ask a question though? With number one, you had told me before even this would not be allowed, correct? Well, we're rewriting it but no. Um, there's something in the current one I'd have to look at it about this, the width of a headband. Yes. So I don't know what it says. That's interesting. I didn't have to enforce the dress code for a whole year. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I'll give my, my two cents. I wanted to listen to everybody else. Um, I, as a former teacher, uh, as but quite a few years ago, just as a, as Nikki alluded to a few moments ago, I, the more rules that we have to enforce, oh, and then, well, they can do this, and then, oh, and then I can't, and then what, what if one teacher doesn't do, you know, and it's it, it, it better to come up with something that is acceptable to everybody's, and, and we have compromise. Is basically what I'm trying to say. There has to be a compromise, and I, I, I cannot go with all option two. I, 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 I personally could not vote for that. I, I just think that's going to lead lead us down a rabbit hole. That's right. Uh, option one, yeah. Option, I, I you know, had that we would give Doctor Woods the authority to to look at this a little more. Maybe with the consult consultation with with, with the, some of the board members, and just see if we could. Maybe make it <coughs> not, not can't do anything or leave it as is, but have a corporation of a few things, but not. I, I just would have a hard time with option two. I, I just, I just think as, as someone who has to enforce it, who has to deal with it, you know, it, it's, it's always nice to say, well, you know, let's do this, let's do that. And it sounds good. And then somebody, though, somewhere down the line, somebody has to be right there. Enforce it every day. But I thought the handbook said that there was a section in the handbook that says that the teachers aren't enforcing that anymore. That it's they're being sent somewhere else, and they're the and Dr. there's Woods, a whole other person that. dealing That's with that now because no. they don't want to take no. the okay. teachers don't want to take yeah. the time out to do that. Uh, and I think the language on that was more about how small is a tank top, how short are shorts. That we don't want teachers getting into that with kids. Not so much. But a black and white thing like a hats on or hats off is is different. Um, yeah, I mean, what well, yeah, that's specifically what we we're trying to address with not having teachers get involved in the those. Like I said, how short are your shorts? Because that's putting our teachers in a very awkward position with young adolescents, especially. Mr. Brotherton, yes, you kind of lost me. Option three, I can see. 
mm -hmm. pretty much everybody not wanting to go with. Okay. And you said you want to compromise. Option two is a compromise. Option one is not a compromise either. I didn't mention about number one. Yes. Well, that, you, that, that's, you said, that's fast quote number one. You know, I mean, I mean, you, and I you, see you, the people you want like to. number one because well, that basically well, says. Let me, let me finish my thought, please. That option one is what we have right now. That's like, yeah. Yes. And I'm hearing some people want option two. I, I'm just saying that I think option two is going from here to here. And I, I think that in my, again, my, my simple view is that's going to complicate things. I think that we, if we fine tune option one, include some more things, I, I don't want to see, well, I'll, I'll just say personally, I don't want to see people wearing hats in school. I just don't, I just don't think that's a good idea. Now, again, you say that's old fashioned, that's old, old school. I, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying this is my view. I mean, everybody else expressed their views. I'm going to express mine. So, but, you know, some other things, as Nick, you said, those things, hey, I, I can I can see those things, but I, I I'm a thing about hats. I, again, I'm old fashioned. So is but it we just do, hats? Pardon? Is it just? Well, hats? I, I don't know. Discuss that. I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm trying to get where where the compromise was. Well, <laughs> if it's if we're not going to go with option one. And option two is is the you know option one is is this now option two is we're what you want we're right well, option three no, is the compromise. option three is that way option, option, three. option three is the that's compromise. why I was trying to say option two was more of a compromise if you're saying the hat part of it I mean that's that's a comfort thing for 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 many people too is that hat you know I don't I don't see no safety issue in that I don't I don't see. I'm just, uh, that's just, I'm just, well, I, mean, I was just kind of well, wondering. But, but allow me my opinion. You know, I'm saying, yes, you know, I'm giving you your opinion, yeah, but no, I was just wondering, like, I was oh, wondering, like, like, were you thinking of option okay, three I'm, and I'm not option two? I let her both speak. Um, I'm, I'm speaking now. Yeah, I'm a personal audience. So yeah. yeah. I'm just telling that's that's how I, 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 I get, I'm old fashioned. And to me, the hat was not supposed to be in school. In school. Outside, PE, or not that's I mean, outside, before school, after school. But not in school. I just didn't like the idea of hat. <clears throat> but now, can I change? Yeah, I can adapt. I'm just telling you what I do, too. As you said, what you said. And they both said, which is fine. So, audience. Yes, Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I, I should have taken some time at the, the, the participation. So, yeah. I appreciate if you allowing me to speak. Just, uh, just, I'm going to ask that the board take a little different uh, view. So we're preparing our children, right, for high school and college and then careers. One of the programs that I, I'm, I'm, I work with is helping young folks enter the workforce. None of the employees, and I just met with some employers today, some new partners, none of them in their dress code are allowing students, employees to wear hats, hoodies, unless it's you know, mechanic or something, right? So uh, I guess, and I'm gonna be brief, I think, I hope. Um, if we're preparing our, our students for work, I understand the comfort, I understand some of those things, but our, our students are resilient. They're gonna, they're gonna adapt to what we allow, and what we don't allow. Right. I would recommend not allowing hats because <clears throat> as a as a when I was an employer, I guess I'm still an employer, I have to talk to these youth about why they can't wear their hood, why they can't wear their hats, why they can't wear their headphones. And the response is always, well, I could do it in high school. I'm gonna I'm gonna bypass college because college you're grown, right? Right? College you're trying to experience it, learn find yourself. But I've always I've, they they tell me I could do it in high school. Some could say I could do it in middle school. <laughs> and, and sometimes I say, well, this isn't high school, this is middle school, right? But I think it, as the, if the board could look at it from a different perspective, I mean, I understand the safety, I understand the comfort. I wear hats too, but the minute I walk in the building, I take it off. Why? Because way back when, 
Yeah. I'm a little bit younger than you, John, but <laughs> I think everybody's younger than me. <laughs> no, no, but but I think we we grew up in some of that same era where men took their hats off, right? Um, well, I mean, uh, yeah, men took their hats off when they entered the building. Period. Right. Period. Right. So I'm asking that maybe you take a different look and not worry so much about the safety, even though that is a factor. And I I, I feel so sad for that young man who. But that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> sure. You know, right. I am keeping it short, ma'am. You shouldn't have said I, you shouldn't have recognized me. <laughs> that's okay, my that's family. You guys know. Right. So, so I guess ask, I'm asking that you take a different standpoint and look at the future of these youth and, and the employers and, and so forth and say, okay, well, while our, while our force, our workforce is changing, I don't see, I don't see many of us on sitting in front of a CEO wearing a hood no. or wearing a hat. No. Scarf may be different, but I'm, 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 I'm not going to touch the women's hair because I don't, I don't know, but that's, that's just my So thank you. As I often do, mm -hmm. come back what you say. Sure. Um, so to me, that's the same comparison as wearing shorts. Women, women were, are allowed to wear skirts. Mm -hmm. I remember being at this school and fighting for the guys to be able to wear shorts because they started wearing skirts so that because they're like, I'm hot. We weren't allowed to wear shorts when I went to school here. Mm -hmm. People are allowed to wear shorts here now because of my class. And that's because the guys started wearing skirts because they're like, wait, 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 oh, the guys let, me get skirts? There. <laughs> let me get there. So they, the guys started wearing skirts because their thing is okay. if girls can wear skirts and it's hot, then, and skirts are allowed, then I should be able to wear a skirt as well because I am hot. So now kids are allowed to wear shorts. Most employers do not allow shorts to be worn, but we allow it here. So to me, it's when you go to work, if there's a dress code, you go to work, there's a dress code. What we are trying to teach our kids here is to be on time, to we learn, we teach them how to advocate for themselves when it comes to speaking to bosses, um, work as a team, that type of thing. As far as dress code, I don't think that's the type of thing that we are trying to teach our children. That is learned as you get older and you go into the workforce because every single job is different. Some jobs you are allowed to wear. My family got mad at me because I would wear a t-shirt and jeans to work. I also worked with dead bodies, so I was allowed to wear that. But my family is very old school and wanted me to dress up, but my employer told me not to. Right, because you so, Though that's that's what I'm saying. That type of thing, you, yeah. it's it's different in every single job. Some job, I work at the U of I. Sometimes some my job now, I mean I work from home. But before, um, we had to be strictly uh, business casual. My previous job at the U of I in a different department, we were allowed to wear jeans and a nice top. It just it all depends, and you just have, you have to. When you get older and you're an adult, you have to go with the flow and realize that it is what it is and a rule is a rule. Okay. But I don't think that you have to be that strict when you're as children. I don't think that I don't think that's the time. I think the time now is for them to learn how to be comfortable with themselves. Okay. If I if I may. And that's very very good. And I'm done. All right. Um, maybe uh, later this evening. Yeah, we just I think the I think the, the I do think it's different. I, I don't think the comparison of the shorts and skirts and um, and hats and so forth is is the same. Um, well, one, I'll go back. I don't know many. I'm in. I came from work, <laughs> wearing shorts on buses, but we were at, we had an activity outside. Um, I think it's easier. Let me say it this way. You listed the the items that that RCS is trying to uh, impress or grow in each student, right? I think I'll wait. Thank you. Okay. Window. Yeah. They'll adapt. 
these are children. If we keep leaning, we'll lean right in the water with them. There is an issue. We know that when a child needs a hoodie on and it's fall outside and it's recess time, we tell every one of you, everybody can go outside. Okay? They're walking around outside, they're playing outside. But no head coverings, if it starts out the school year as no head coverings, they'll adapt. They're not going to go all nine months saying if they had just let me worn a head covering, I'd have all AIDS. They'll adapt. They, they, they will adapt. I'm looking, from, looking at it from a safety point of view. I'm also looking at it from Johnny, take that cap off. Teachers should, as you say, these are the things that you do. They should be teaching and not having to continue to say, take that cap off, or a student throwing the cap to another one, or the student is trying to reset. Just start it out with if it's zero, it's zero. They'll adapt. These are children. And you're saying you want them to do this and do that. But you also have to dress for success. Mr. Hall is on one side with the young people. I just had the same meeting with me on the other side with mine last week. You know, I, 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 the t-shirt thing, nobody in here ever has ever seen me in the t-shirt. I don't wear t-shirts, but I can't allow you to be a part of the program and go to work when you're around people who's in college shirts every day and you got on a white t-shirt. So I put three people aside individually and told them, if you're going to play the part, you need to know the rules. So they will adapt. No, it will be a good no. You'll see. They're not going to raise all kinds of because they can't wear it. Let them start off the year with nothing on their head. And you will see, unless somebody comes out of this room and say, you all know that you could have been wearing head covers, but it was stopped in this room on the 14th of July of 2022. They are fine. Some of the students who are coming in haven't ever been here anyway, so they don't know. It's the same thing with the lunches at the high school. There was not a child at the high school that just graduated that ever went off campus for lunch because it didn't happen. It wasn't at Ada and it wasn't there. They'll adapt. These are children, they'll adapt. I respectfully agree. And I think when we do that and we keep, if we keep it the, the same way that it was, that we are um, not thinking about our children of color who choose of color, who, who choose not to come to school because their hair isn't done. That, that's, the, that's the excuse they may use, Miss Nikki. But it's not the reason they're not coming to school. I'm, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm in, I'm in, because I disagree with you because I've talked to Mr. Dr. Woods, who explained how one of our secretaries has to do children's hair mm -hmm. often because their hair isn't done, so that they can go to class so, because they choose to wear a head cover. They want to wear a head cover because they are embarrassed. So I mean, I, I just don't think that we're going to agree. That's all. And, and that's fine. Yeah. I mean, but I'm just stating that's, yeah. That's how I feel. Anybody else report? Any comment? Okay, would like to make a motion for one of these options? Oh. I thought we had to pick an option. Yeah. We have to go through the process. What option do you want to, we'll vote for them. You know, if you want to put option two, we'll vote on it. That's what you want to do, Nikki. I mean, that's what we're here for. We'll make option two, we can, you, we can vote on that. Yes. Okay. Move to use option two okay. in the student family handbook. Okay. okay. Somebody will second that. I second that. Okay. Mr. Brotherton. Well, time we got the oh. yes. no. um, <laughs> <laughs> idea. The um, also I just want to clarify, I did it on the screen, but um, in option two that part in the parenthetical was not supposed to be there. So that's not part of it. Um, it's so what you're voting on the whole student handbook, obviously, and then 
Option two is the all the dress code with just this sentence different. And um, that is that students may wear head coverings that do not cover the face and or ears, including hoods, do rags, hats, hair bonnets, and head scarves and head wraps. Comment. I thought we have already discussed. I don't want to discuss now. Anybody else want to? Seeing none. Mr. Do the vote. Mr. Brotherton. Nay. Moto Johnson. Aye. Katie Johnston. Aye. Diana Mendoza. Nay. Nikki Pettit. Aye. Joe Robinson. Nay. Okay. It is time. So that means the motion does not carry. Um, and so we will um, we'll talk. We bring this back. Otherwise, it's the current student dress code that's in place until we come to a majority decision on which way to go. So Dr. Moore, can you read this up? Procedural? So we will know out in the public what I take back to them, what's in the handbook. Well, what's currently in the student handbook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what we're going to continue with right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's option one. Mm -hmm. option that was one. option one. one. Yeah. Well, we did not approve options, so we had to just keep it. So, okay. <clears throat> Okay. Let's see anybody else. We got next is what information is that right? Yes. I mean, For you, I can't believe it. We didn't have any. Can't believe it. All right. <laughs> Uh, so in the information items for the public and for our board is the care programming update, which is a revised program document included in the packets that actually it's Kelly Crawford who's not here right now who helped write that up. Also included in your packet is the superintendent evaluation tool that's me. Um, there's a proposed tool included in the packet. The tool aligns with the superintendent's contractual goals. Um, you're asked to review that, and if you have feedback for on that evaluation tool, bring that to the board. Bring that to the yes. um, Tentative budget. This is this is a change for us. Uh, I've shared it, I think, with most of you, but um, we are required to post. Um, we have to require to post things that have to be done 30 days before the tentative budget is presented. We typically don't do that posting. Um, until after we've presented it the first time. Okay, so I'm just notifying the board that we are going to do the required postings, which is like a newspaper ad and things, 30 days before you'll be asked to vote to approve the tentative budget. But our meeting's August 18th and the next meeting September 15th, so there's not actually 30 days in there. So it's going to be a slightly different order on that. Um, but it will be posted properly like it's supposed to. Um, administrative cost waiver. This is something that I just became aware of last week. We actually did approve this last year. I was waiting on a letter from the state board to tell me we had to do it again. And they didn't. And they didn't send me a letter. So I called them last week and they said, oh yeah, you have to do it. So um, we will work on that. And I hope to have that before you. It's just, it's a procedural thing that we have to do. Um, and that's it for the information items, unless there are any questions on those. Questions? Okay. Yes, it was number 11, board of superintendent comments. Superintendent? I don't have anything. I have a question. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, so there is no newspaper now in that tool. Where will that be posted? It's posted in the News Gazette. Oh, bam. Yeah, it's always been that way. And we ran through press's function. Uh, I've not heard back from anybody, but I did get a new phone, as I told Dr. Woods. I, uh, I lost everything, but I got it back. Okay. But I did not see anybody responding to about the school, what school they'd like to mentor, or not mentor, but uh, to be involved with. So you get that to me as soon as you could. Appreciate it. 
and I, I get my school ones now, so I'll just send by the school or whatever you see that if you want my email address, I'll have that to you. Option. So you're a board member. I do. I just wanted to apologize to you for taking up some of your um public comment by speaking. I apologize. <laughs> And you know what, that hat, you know, that he's talking about went and 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 went I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. I second. 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 And Nikki seconded. John Brotherton. Aye. Margo Johnson. Aye. Katie Johnston. Aye. Diana Mendoza. Aye. Nikki Pettit. Aye. Bill Robinson. All right. Thank you. Don't fall, Dan. I know. The problem with the chairs is me. I know.